I'd like for you to take your Bibles tonight and turn to the Gospel of John, the prophets of old. In Isaiah, other places in the Old Testament, prophesied of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. They told about his coming. They said many wonderful things about the Lord Jesus. But there is a prophecy in the Old Testament. When I first read this prophecy, I never understood it. And so I did it with it like I've done with hundreds of places in the Word of God. When I did not understand it, I did not deny its reality. I did not say it was a myth. I did not say it was baloney. I simply said I don't understand it. And I'll just let it lie dormant. Maybe someday somebody will help me to understand. Well, it wasn't the somebody that helped me to understand, but it was the very keys that I teach in the foundational class that God inspired my heart one day and showed me this great record in the Gospel of John. And this was the explanation of a prophecy which was stipulated back in Isaiah, a prophecy that stated, in essence, the following, that when the true Messiah would come, who would be our Lord and our Savior, the one who would be God's only begotten Son, the one who would do exactly what the prophets of old had always spoken about, Isaiah said that when this man would come, he would do one miracle, a miracle which had never been done before in the history of the world. And the doing of this miracle would be the proof in the census world that he was God's only begotten Son and that he was the promised Messiah, that he was the Redeemer. The record, the record of that miracle is written in the Gospel of John in the ninth chapter. And in this closing session of our advanced class, it is this portion of the Word of God that I have reserved for my advanced class and for the spiritual enjoyment and enrichment of all of our people who are gathered here tonight and our people listening by radio as well as those across the nation who will be receiving the tapes of this closing session. We read in the first verse of the ninth chapter, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his what? Birth. Blind from his birth. And this had been the prophecy of old, that this man would be healed, that a man would be healed who had been born blind. You can read a lot of miracles in the Old Testament. You can read a lot of wonderful things that men of God did in the Old Testament, but there is one thing they never did. Not one of the miracles in the Old Testament records the record of a man of God opening the eyes of a man who was born blind. But over here tonight, we have that historic record when it occurred, and who did it? And this is the greatness of this record. Verse 2, And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his what, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. These first five verses need our attention very closely because we have here a number of very difficult statements. First of all, it is not difficult to read and to understand the first verse where it says, the man was blind from his birth, which means that he was born blind. But the second verse is the one that the reincarnationists use. The people who 
talk about having existed in another life before and they come back now and they're back for the third or the fourth trip here. They use this verse to teach reincarnation. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his what? If this man sinned, he was born how? Blind, then he must have sinned in a previous existence because he could not have sinned in this one if he was what? Born blind. So they said, did this man sin in his previous existence? This is the argument they use. Who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? I would like to say to you that the record here, if you'll go back, you'll find out is addressed to men and women, not to women, sorry, to men. The record in the Bible is addressed to men. Here in John chapter 8, men who were the heads of the temple in Jerusalem, the 70, the Sanhedrin, who controlled the spiritual operation of that. And among those men, the vast majority of them were born of the seed of the serpent. They were Pharisees and scribes. And Jesus had told them in verse 44 of the 8th chapter, Ye are of your father, what? The devil. And if you're, if, if you're born, if you're born of the devil, you're born of the wrong seed. And you have seed in you. And that's the unforgivable sin to be born of the wrong seed. And he said, You're of your father, the devil. And so, these people who were of their father, the devil, they had all their reincarnation stuff and everything else all screwed up. They've been in a mess all the time. And it was these who said, and who had been teaching to the disciples, and they brought this word to the disciples, and the disciples simply said, All right, Master, you explain it. That doesn't mean that the disciples believed what was said here, but they had heard what these men had said to Jesus in chapter 8. And so his disciples said, All right, Master, you explain it. They asked him to explain it to everybody there, saying, Who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born what? And Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his what? That, you know, takes the reincarnationists and just chops them off right below the ears. He said this man did not sin. He could not have because he was not in existence before. Then he did something else which was wonderful to those people, those Sadduc Pharisees and Sadducees. You know what he said? Neither did his what? Parents. And that's remarkable. You know why? Because many people believe that the reason they have a child born with an infirmity, that they, the parents, are the ones who sinned, and that it is God who is just bringing this on them because they sinned. We have people all over our country today, good church people, who believe that because a child dies in infancy, they condemn themselves and say, well, it must have been the way I lived when I was a boy, or the I, way I lived when I was a young lady. Maybe it's because of the fight my husband and I once had. This, this is our sin upon the child. That's the correction Jesus makes here, and don't you ever forget it. He said, Neither has this child sinned, nor his what? Parents. Then you should put a period. King James has this in, in verse 3. You should put a period after the word parents, because that settles the whole thing. Neither hath this man sinned, nor his what? Do you understand it? Verse 4 now should begin with the word but. And this should set it in contrast with that which precedes. 
But, now here we go, we've got a man who is born blind, right? He did not sin. There isn't any reincarnation, Jesus said, nor did his what? Parents sin. Now we've got something to start with. Verse 4, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work, period. End of verse 4. Now it all makes sense. You know, according to the King James, what it says? It says in verse 3, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. That's why he was sick. That's why he was born blind. He was born blind that the works of God should be made. If he was born blind that the works of God should be made manifest in him, then God made him blind. And that's an impossibility because the word of God says that in God there's no darkness. And God does not send sickness. God does not make people blind. And just Taking this verse and working it accurately is worth an education in the accuracy of God's Word. Again, I like to read it to you because people, this thing is tremendous. Jesus answered, verse 3, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his what? Parents. Period. Now start a new verse. But, that the works of God should be made manifest in him, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night cometh, the night cometh when no man can what? Then there's a time coming. There's a time coming when the works that we are to do with the power of God in us can no longer be worked. There's a time coming. The answer to that is given in next verse. As long as I am in the world, I am the what? So as long as he is here, as long as he is here, then these works of God can be carried out by the believers. Now you put all this together with the greatness of Corinthians, for instance, that we have been given the, the ministry of what? Re and the word of what? Reconciliation. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And if Christ is in you, if Christ is in you, the hope of glory, where is he then? Right here. Where the believers, wherever a believer is, he's there. And he is the light of what? Therefore, that light's here. That's why you know what this verse says when you rightly divide the word? As long as the church, the born-again believers, the church which started on the day of Pentecost, not the church building, not those who just have their names on the roll book, but those who are born again of God's Spirit and know God's word, as long as that church is here, the light is what here. But there's a day coming, the Bible says, when he's going to gather the church unto himself, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be joined with them. When that day comes, this record that is recorded here in John 9 and the works that the church is to do will terminate. But as long as he's here, it's going to be here. Once again, look at the greatness of it. But that the works of God should be made manifest that the works of God should be made manifest, shown forth. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work, but as long as I am in the world, I am the light of what? Well, praise the Lord. That's the story. That's the beginning of it. Now, after he had made this wonderful statement of truth and the presentation of the greatness of this word, he turned to this man who had been born blind. And it says in verse 6, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground. He spit on some ground. 
You know how he spit on it? Look here, it's very simple. He picked up a handful, put a little dust, a little dirt in his hand here, and he spit on it. And he made what? Clay. He made clay of the spittle and the ground. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with what? Is there any healing power in clay? Not enough to take a man who was born blind and heal him, but there's a tremendous truth here. Here was a man born blind. There were a lot of other people who had been born blind in this land where Jesus ministered. Why should it just be this one man? For the same reason that there were a whole multitude of sick and impotent folk waiting for the moving of the water. Solomon's porch, but only one got delivered. For the same reason that a man lay at the temple gate beautiful, Jesus walked by him all the time. Every time Jesus went in the temple, he never prayed for that man. He never ministered to him. But one day a Peter and John happened by, and that was the day, and that was the hour. Why? Revelation. That's it. That's where we've been in the advanced class. Revelation. God, by revelation, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, said to Jesus, pick up some dirt in your hand and spit on it, make some mud pies, little clay, and plunk it in each one of the ears. Put each eye. Put it on each one of his eyes. How did Jesus know to do this? Word of knowledge, God told him. Word of wisdom told him how to do it. And Jesus Christ obeyed God's word. Now that's the silliest thing in the world, to take a little mud and splatter it into a blind man's eye. A blind man's eye? No. It's not silly if God says to do it. Now there happens to be something in Eastern culture and Eastern Orientalisms that I think ought to tell you regarding this truth. And that is that the Eastern people believe that a man of God, if he's really a man of God, that his spittle is holy. And this man must have believed this. And Jesus knew this by revelation. And so he met the man's need according to the revelation that God gave him. And so he took that little dust, he spit in it, made some clay and put it in each one of the eyes. Each one of his eyes. And then he did something else. Verse 7. And he said, You're healed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. No. He said, Go wash. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Why didn't he tell him to go wash in the pool at Bethesda? Why didn't he tell him to go wash in the Jordan? Because a prophet had told Naaman to go wash in the Jordan. Why did he tell him to go wash in the pool of Siloam? Again, the word of what? Knowledge. The word of knowledge. Other times people get healed, they never have to go wash in the Jordan or in the pool of Siloam. You see how a knowledge of the manifestations of the Spirit makes the Word of God living and real and understandable and intelligible? And without that, you walk in darkness on the Word of God. You just read it. It was like Mrs. Wade said tonight, it's just story until you get that knowledge of the Word and then it has an effervescence and it has a glow. It has a heartbeat. It has a dynamite to it that few people have ever seen. He said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now the word of God means what it says, and it says what it means. So what do you think Jesus meant when he said, Go wash in the pool of Siloam? 
He meant go wash in the pool of Siloam. He didn't mean go jump in the bathtub. He didn't mean go up to your lavatory and take it and turn on the spigot and wash your eyes out. He meant go into the pool of Siloam. Ladies and gentlemen, this becomes so important because the average person never believes that God's Word means what it says and that it says what it means. They believe they can toy with it all the time. When God's Word said, if you're not born again of God's Spirit, you have no eternal life abiding within you, they believe they've got eternal life from the time that they're born. And all they have to do is be exposed to the right environment. They're all going to have it anyways. And if they don't make it this trip, They'll be in reincarnated in another body and they'll get it all over again. That's right. Reminds me of the man that got in through reincarnation story and he had been a man and he turned out to be an Angus bull down in Kansas. <laughs> Crazy world. You know why they get into all this soup? Because they all want to know better than God's Word. Ladies and gentlemen, down through the history of society, all these thousands of years have always been men and women who thought they knew more than God's Word. Some of the critics have said that by the time they died, the Word of God would no longer be read any place. Those critics are dead and gone, and some of us are just beginning to read the ineffable greatness of that Word. The Word's still here and there gone. The Word of God is always the will of God. It means what it says, and it says what it means, ladies and gentlemen. And God has a purpose for everything he says, where he says it, why he says it, how he says it, to whom he says it, when he says it. And here was a man who was born blind. And I tell you, they were watching him with hawk eyes, eagle eyes, because nobody had ever been healed before. And they knew, somehow or other, they knew that in a previous life he must have sinned or his daddy and mommy must have sinned like real troopers. And so they watched Jesus. And I can just see the pictures, all these brains, these theological grads standing around, you know, watching Jesus. And he does the stupidest thing in the world. He picks up a little bit of dirt and he spits in it. And he goes, boop, boop on each eye, and says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. You know what those fellows were doing? You know good and well what they were doing. Scratching their head, <laughs> laughing up their sleeve. That's right. That's what they were doing. They, you know what they'd have said in modern terms? Better send them to Toledo or to Dayton. I don't know where you send them in Columbus. They thought Jesus was off his rocker. They thought he was crazy in the head. Catched or something. Catched or something. He was way out. That's what they thought. And when you look at it sense knowledge-wise, it doesn't make any sense, I grant you that. That a man should pick up a little bit of dirt, put a little bit of spit on it, and plonk it into a man's eyes and tell him, go over there and wash in the pool of Siloam. Why, it just doesn't make any sense at all. But that's remarkable, because when it comes to the new birth, it doesn't make any sense either. And yet it makes all the sense in the world when you carry out what God said. When he said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe God raised him from the dead, you're going to be what? Sense knowledge wise doesn't make any sense, but it makes all the sense in the world when you do it. For then the word of God, the will of God, you get the results of it. He said, go wash in the pool of Silo. Now I want you to know something, that before you can get deliverance from God, you have to have the word of God. Remember, first you find out what's available. Secondly, how to what? And thirdly, what? Here you got it again. Boy, that man been sitting around from the time he'd been born. Nobody had ever healed him. He was born blind. All they were saying, well, tell us when you sinned. What did you do in your previous existence? Or, come on, Daddy and Mommy, how come he's born blind? What did you do? But nobody around to give him any help. One day he got that word of God, and it was so simple. 
It was so simple. Simply put a little mud in his eye and said, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Truth is always simple. Error is complicated. The reason these people have so much difficulty understanding the Word of God and believing God's Word is because they're all in error. Truth is simple. Error is complicated. He said, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. The man had the Word, knew exactly what to do. Now it's up to the man to do what? Do it. The man to carry it out. Because the true God never possesses. He never controls. He gives us a greatness of his word. And he said, whosoever will may come. Remember? A wonderful truth. Go wash in the pool of Silo. And I want to tell you, unless this man literally carries out the word of God, he's not going to get the results of God. And then you can begin to see again for the hundred and eleventh time or more how every place in the Word of God when men of God tapped into the abundance of God, they always literally obeyed the Word. And yet I hear people saying all the time, we teach the accuracy of God's Word and we talk about the four crucified with Jesus and when I get all through, some brain pops up. So what? So what? So what? What difference does it make if two died with Jesus or if four? Because Jesus the most important. That fellow's a liar to begin with. He doesn't even believe in the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. If he did, he'd accept the greatness of God's Word. It's just a misnomer. It made all the difference in the world to anybody in the Word that ever God delivered. When Jesus meant two, he said two. When he meant four, he said four. When the Word of God says do, it means do. When he said to this man, go wash in the pool of Siloam, you know what he meant? Go wash in the pool of Siloam. And did you ever notice the record, how wonderful it said? Puts her all in one verse. Huh. He went his way, therefore. He went his way. He went his way, therefore. Where did he go? To the pool of what? And what did he do with the pool? He washed exactly according to the word of the Lord, and he came on. Amen. That's what the word says. That's what it means. A man who was born blind. You talk about having believing faith. We talk about having believing faith to get the film off and running. Good gravy, here was a man who was born blind, and the only word he had was, go wash in the pool of Silo. Put yourself in his place. Suppose you were 35, 40 years of age, and you had been born blind, and somebody like V.P. Whirlwell or Mel George or Peter Wade said to you, Go wash in the New Bremen Creek. Would you? Would you? This man, all he had was go wash where? In the pool of Silo. And it's a remarkable story, ladies and gentlemen, because Jesus didn't argue with him. Jesus didn't say to this man, Look, you poor fellow, you've been blind all these years. Won't you please, just once in your life, believe God's Word and go wash in the pool of Silo. Won't you just please take the time and try it out? After all, you know, you can't lose anything. You've been blind. And if you stay blind the rest of the days of your life, you haven't lost a thing. Why don't you just try out God? Boy, you never get anything by trying out God, because God doesn't have to be tried. He's been proven. He is God Almighty. The average person likes for you to beg him to do things of God. Ladies and gentlemen, never beg anybody to do a thing of God. If they don't want to do it, give them God's word and let them go. For no man is entitled to hear the word of God the second time until he believes it the first time. 
Jesus said to that man, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he left him alone. And the man believed. How do I know he believed? Because believe is to act, right? And it says he went and what? Washed. To believe is to receive. All believing equals receiving. But if you come down and, and if he just said, well, I'll go to the pool and I'll try. I'll try it out to see if God really means what he says. You know what happened to that man? He'd have been as blind tonight as he was then if he was still living. He went believing. He believed that if he went to that pool and he washed, he'd come seeing. And that's what the Word said. He went to that pool, he washed, and that man did what? He saw his blindness was gone. Boy, you can teach this to your Sunday school children, to your young people, and to your adults. And every time you read it and every time you see it and you just sit back in the greatness of the all that the believing that was in that man who had been born blind that somebody should say to him go wash in the pool of Siloam and that man believed literally that it must be God speaking for he went, he washed and he came see. No wonder it upset the apple cart for everybody. Because nobody outside of Jesus and the man believed it would be done. That's all. Those Pharisees and scribes and the Sadducees that were around, they were laughing up their sleeve. They knew it couldn't be done. But there was one man there, one word of God, and that man believed that word of God. And against all odds, he proved it. No wonder everybody got disturbed. No wonder we're going to have some trouble in the rest of the chapter. Because immediately after this thing happens, boy, a halakos breaks loose across the whole area and everybody gets all disturbed and excited. And you know, the first thing they do is call in the neighbors. You've got to get the neighbors involved. Because the neighbors have to get concerned about your life. They've got to know your business about better than you do. You know that. So we have a real opportunity here in verse 8. <laughs> the neighbors, therefore, and they which had seen him that he was blind said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some of the neighbors said, Yep, this is he. Others said, He is what? Sounds just like neighbors. They didn't even know him. <laughs> Some said, yes, that's our neighbor. Somebody said, well, it looks like our neighbor. But he said, I am your neighbor. I am he. Therefore, verse 10, said they unto him, How were your eyes open, boy? How did you get your eyes open? He answered and said, A man who is called Jesus made what? Clay, anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I, next word, received what? How did he get it? By taking it. That's the only way you ever get anything from God is by receiving it, by taking it. This advanced class, the only reason you moved as fast and far as you have, because as I taught the Word, you did what? You received it. You made it your own. Jesus said to the man, Go wash the pool of Siloam. The man believed. And as he believed, he received. He took it. He said, Well, that's what the man of God said. He didn't even know it was the man of God, but he said, The man Jesus said, And therefore I believe he meant what he said. I'll just take it. That's how he received his son. Now, verse 12, the neighbors still involved. They said, all right, where is this fellow? They said unto him, where is he? You say he did it? All right, produce him. Bring him in here. Let him speak too. <laughs> and you know something? He said, I don't even know where he is. He said, I know not. Verse 12. Now, verse 13. 
we really get the religious groups involved. Now the neighbors take him and said, all right, that may be you, but boy, we don't believe it. Now, well, here you go, boy. And they pick him up by the seat of the pants and they drag him up to the highest outfit they knew. They brought him to the Pharisees. Now we got the church involved, the temple, you know. The unbelieving believers, or the unbelieving unbelievers, I don't know which. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was what? Blind. And oh my goodness, the first thing they come up with, that it was what? The, oh, that's terrible. It's the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his what? Man, you'd know their reaction to this, wouldn't you? So he's already in the soup. Verse 15. After they argue about that a while, then again the Pharisees also asked him, the man, how he had received his sight. And he said unto them, He put clay on mine eyes, and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God. No, sir, he's not of God because he does not keep the what? Sabbath day. And others of the Pharisees said, Well, how can a man who's a sinner do these miracles? And there was the usual manifestation among the group. There was a what? Division among them. <laughs> so they say, verse 17, unto the blind man again. You see, they're giving him the third degree, maybe the fifth. They're really burning him. Sure. They say unto the blind man again, what sayest thou of him that opened thine eyes? And he, the blind man, said, He is a what? A prophet is a man of God. So the blind man said, He's a man of God. Well, some of the Pharisees says He can't be of God because He opened His eyes if He did it on the Sabbath day. Others said, Well, how could a man do this if he were a sinner? So there was a division among them. But the man who'd been healed said, He's a man of God. Boy, that took courage. You know why? Because the man who'd, who had just been healed of blindness, he had his axe right on the, what it slammed. That's right. Because he was be appearing before the top echelon of the religious leaders of his day, and they could just chop his head off whenever they wanted to. But instead of drawing in his horns, instead of him saying anything less, he said that was a man of God. <laughs> I had a fellow tell me a while back he'd like to come to the way headquarters, but he couldn't afford to come here because of what the people thought in the community. Ha! Look at that story! Look at that story! You'll see later on that these were just not men in the community, one with a little, with a little lack of power. These were men who could excommunicate you, who could take your bread away from you, who would have the opportunity so you wouldn't have any place to sleep. But he stood right in front of all of them and he said, I want to tell you, he is a what? A prophet. He is a prophet. He is a prophet. That's right. What verse are we? 18. Ha <laughs> ha. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been what? Blind and received his sight until now they call his what? Parents. Now we get the parents involved. And they asked him, asked them, verse 19, saying, Is this your son, whom ye say was born what? How then doth he now see? You explain it to us. Verse 20, His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born what? But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, he's an adult. Ask him, he shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared what? Boy, what a great daddy and mommy. Terrible, isn't it? They had a son who was born blind. And the son was healed. But this daddy and mommy didn't have the courage of their own weight of their hair to stand for what was right. 
Hey, if you had a son who had been born blind and he got to be 40 years old or so and a man of God came along and set that man free, you know what you ought to do for that man of God? And for your son? You ought to stand and say, yes, that is right. But the parents did not do it because of one word, what? Fear, for fear. Fear always enslaves. Fear always in cases. Fear always makes you less than what you want to be and what you really ought to be. But for fear of the Jews, they spoke that way. Why did they speak this way? For the Jews had agreed already. You see, you haven't got a chance because they'd already made up their mind ahead of time that if any man did confess that this Jesus was the Christ, he'd be put out of the synagogue. Now, that doesn't mean much to us today. You know why? When they throw you out of the United Church of Christ, the Presbyterians are glad enough to have you. And when the Baptists get rid of you, the United Church of Christ will take anybody, so they're glad to have you. That wasn't true in that day. You see, today to excommunicate somebody is just almost folly. But in that day, when you were excommunicated, you couldn't have a place to sleep you could not buy bread in that town, ladies and gentlemen. Nobody would speak to you. Nobody would give you clothing or house or any other thing. You'd walk down the street on this side, and everybody would walk on the other side. They wouldn't talk to you. The Jews had agreed already that if anybody said that this Jesus was the Christ, they'd be excommunicated. They really had the clamps into the people. The parents got caught in it too. Therefore, verse 23, said his parents, he is of age to what? Because his parents were afraid they were going to be excommunicated. Verse 24, Then again called they the man, that was blind, this is a third time, and said unto him, Give God the praise, brother, give God the praise. Praise the Lord, brother, give God the praise. We know this man who did it to you is a what? Hey, great, sounds like a real religious meeting, huh? Give God the praise. You know what? They just forgot to say which God. Because they said that this Jesus was a what? They must have had something wrong. Remember in the advanced class where they said he had Beelzebub? And of those men who said this of Jesus, they were born a what? The wrong seed. They were born of the death. The same group's talking to him. They say, give God the praise. Give God the praise. They just forgot to say which God. Whatever somebody says, be, give God the praise. You always find out from them which God they want you to praise. Whether it's the God of this world, who is Satan, or the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of difference. But I can just see this picture, you know. They say, all right, give God the praise, brother. Give God the praise. Not that Jesus. Give God the praise. <laughs> Verse 25. He answered and said, boy, now this is remarkable. Whether he be a sinner or not, I don't know. I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I what? Oh, glory, hallelujah. If we arrived at that place and quit stewing about whether B.P. Werwell's got a pocketbook in his right hip or in his left hip, whether Reverend Wade carries his change in his right pocket or in his vest pocket, whether I eat bologna for breakfast or soup for supper, we'd get some of the things that God done. You know, the Pharisees were concerned whether this Jesus had done it on the right day and all these other things. And you know what the man who was born blind was concerned about? One thing only, he got set free. He didn't ask Jesus whether he ate breakfast at 8 or 9. He didn't ask him whether he carried his wallet in his right hip or on his left hip. He didn't ask him whether he went to church every Sunday morning and prayed at the right altar. He didn't ask him anything. He could have been carrying his turkey dinner in a basket upside down. He wasn't concerned. He's only one thing. He said, I was blind and now I was. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
Boy, when you get to the place that you just believe God's Word and quit paying attention what kind of vessels it pours out of as long as it's the Word, that's it. The Word and nothing but that wonderful Word of God, it'll set men and women free when they believe. Oh, bless your heart. Verse 26. <laughs> I tell you, they're after him. They said, then said they to him again. Tell us once more, what did he do to thee? How opened he thine eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already. And ye did not hear, wherefore would ye hear it again? Do you also want to be his disciple? Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, ooh, ooh. man, oh man. That, that takes a little courage, doesn't it? Because they had already agreed they'd do what? Excommunicate him. And finally, he just says, all right, you want to hear it once more? Are you really want to hear it? You want to be sure you want to be one of his disciples, huh? <laughs> Verse 28. Then they what? Reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple. You're his disciple, but we are what? We're Moses' disciple. Moses' disciple. And we know that God spake unto Moses. But as for this fellow, this Jesus fellow, we don't even know from whence he is. Verse 30. And the man had never graduated from a theological cemetery like these others had who had just spoken to him. The man answered and said unto them, Why, fellows, herein is a marvelous thing that you do not know from whence he is, and yet he has opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, verse 32, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of, the one, of one that was born blind? Isaiah 35, 5 is the record. If this man were not a God, he could do what? Nothing. Isn't that a marvelous thing to say to them? They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they what? Cast him out. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. What a tremendous thing. Jesus heard. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And who went looking for him? Jesus. Not his daddy and mother. Not his mother and father. Not the people in the church. Not the neighbors. Not the ministers. Nobody. Nobody except one. It's a heart-rending story, isn't it? But I want to tell you, that one is the best. That one and a believer always make a majority. The people may excommunicate you, and ladies and gentlemen, you're headed for it. If you don't know it, I'm telling you. When you walk with the greatness of the Word of God, there isn't one organized denomination that can stand you because of the abundance of the word that lives within you. But even if they can't, even if men and women in this society of ours kick up their heels, that you have to stand alone, the word still says there is one standing with you, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember one of the records we studied in the advanced class? Choose ye whom ye will serve this day. Remember? If the true God be God, serve him. If Baal be God, serve him. And one little prophet of God with, with the power of God put the fire under. 
the altar, remember? There's another record in the Old Testament. I think it was Moses or one of the other men of God said, Whom choose ye this day? And he said, But as for me and my house, we shall serve what? The man said, I may have been excommunicated from the synagogues and temples. I perhaps cannot buy any bread. I can't even find a place to sleep. But I want to tell you something, he said, that this man who opened my eyes could not have been a sinner. And since the world began, has it never been heard that anybody opened the eyes of a man who was born blind? And this man who did this was of God. And they cast him out. And when they cast him out, Jesus was the only one who came looking for him. And when he had found him, verse 35, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? <laughs> oh, people. He didn't, even, he didn't even know the Lord, the Son of God. He didn't know him. It is like saying to somebody today, he's not born again of God's Spirit, and yet God healed him. He was not saved, and yet God healed him. A remarkable truth. He didn't even know the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said unto him, verse 37, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talked with thee. And he, the man, said, Lord, I what? Amen. Lord, I what? That's it. And he worshipped him. The man was born blind. The only record he had was go wash in the pool of Siloam. That's all the word he had. He literally believed that word, and it got him into all kind of trouble. It cost him everything in this world. Everything sense knowledge-wise that man had to pay. His daddy and mother ridiculed him. They didn't ridicule him in public, but I mean in private, but publicly they wouldn't really stand with him. The neighbors laughed at him. The people who we went to the synagogue with week after week, month after month, and where he had given his support all that lifetime, laughed him to scorn. Laughed him to scorn. And yet, Charlie, that one man, said, he is a prophet. And when Jesus found him and described to him what it was all about, he said to Jesus, Lord, I want believe. Lord, I believe. And he worshipped the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the greatest record I know in God's Word. One of the things this proves is that everybody else may be against you. They may say that no matter what you'll do, you're never going to be healed. God can't deliver you because Mayo said it couldn't be done. Everybody else said it couldn't be done. Here was a man born blind, and yet that one man got the Word of God, he believed God's Word, and he didn't mess around. He didn't say, I'll try it out. He didn't say, I'm coming down just to get prayed for tonight. It can't hurt me even if it doesn't do me any good, so I'll try it out. No. It was his all or nothing, Ron.